now we're recording. Say everything again, Jonathan, all of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the first time we've messed that up. All right, moving on. Um, so I was curious, Jonathan, you mentioned unit tests, and I was wondering if you've integrated uh, tracing into the development practice at all at, at Facebook. Is that a thing people think about when they're, they're writing their code and kind of integrating it into how they're testing and developing? Or is it still just something that gets kind of layered in and is thought more about as a production thing? Um, so sometimes developers have to think about it. Um, we end up having enough systems built on top of it that effectively they get a lot of the benefits of tracing without realizing that tracing is happening. Um, and so what developers typically will see is like if they're developing some feature, we'll see like some high level like um, here's some aggregate breakdown of like your performance and where things are heading um, without having to sort of think about sprinkling tracing in because we have enough of it at the base layers so that, um, and or like, you know, other profiling data pulled in like uh, CPU sampling um, and like on mobile apps, particularly like dynamic instrumentation of function methods. So of functions. Um, so it tends to be one of those things of most developers don't hit it. Some developers when they're diagnosing will then have to go and say like, the default instrumentation isn't giving me enough. I need to go add in some custom instrumentation to figure it out. Um, but that, and then at that point then they sort of are aware of the tracing libraries. Um, mm. Regarding the unit tests. Um, so it, I guess it, um, you, we're all so it's all built on top of the canopy paper and so canopy sort of had this notion of like a trace pattern um and so effectively what we're trying to do is extend that out to say like measuring trace quality and measuring trace breakages by expressing patterns that say we expect an end-to-end -end trace to have these particular types these particular fields um these are the fields we care about like if these go away the pattern fails and so like, something has broken which depends upon this uh, ideally those patterns are then also used like directly for the metrics that you care about. So you don't need to write them twice. Um, you can just simply say, I want a pattern which is going to pull out this particular field from, you know, the end systems along the trace. And then if that field isn't there, that pattern will just fail. And then we'll be like, you know, something has broken in this trace. Um, that does, that's not integrated in the developer flow at all. So like, we can still get into cases where like somebody commits a diff, um, they break the traces, that hits prod, we realize that it's broken and then we're like, okay, let's go revert. Um, huh, that's interesting. So it's almost a bit of formal verification almost, though a very kind of simple version of that. There's a seed stage company that, that I don't think is out of stealth or anything, but they're, kind of doing this, but with uh, a technology that can integrate and develop workflows so you can write assertions about um, about uh, system properties that are only visible in the distributed trace, and then they actually enforce those in band. So it's kind of like, um, it's, it's one of these things that uh, takes advantage of the context to do more than propagating trace and span IDs and they actually propagate a little bit of state um, a la pivot tracing or something in order to uh, to verify assertions down the stack. So you can say, for instance, I'm writing a test up here and I want to verify the database layer that, you know, this field is equal to whatever. And then they can assert that uh, via this um, this like testing API and then and then run the test in like an integration environment before it gets committed. It's pretty interesting. I think it, if you have like really good hygiene around instrumentation, it's a it's a in my mind a pretty powerful thing to be able to do versus a normal integration test where everything has to be programmed to emit things and you have to you know reach across a lot of boundaries in order to test like rather simple end to end behaviors. So that, I, I like the idea of it a lot, although it does it leans pretty heavily on instrumentation. In terms of the larger presentation, Ted, that you did, um, which I thought was interesting, the, uh, um, 
the quote unquote agent thing. I, I don't like that word because it means different things, different people for sure. But uh, I have been thinking a lot about the fact that um, uh, what you know, like Jonathan said that a lot of application developers aren't really aware of tracing. It's certainly the same way at Google because it was built in a layer that they don't know about. If you know, in some ways, an agent is something that's there so you don't know about the tracing or something. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's done through through interposition and black box uh, in black box instrumentation. It can be done by instrumentation that's just linked in dynamically at, at you know um, on demand or just in time. Um, but I I would like to get to a place where um, where for common frameworks and common uh, uh, in you know per service application architecture, you could get open tracing stood up without making any code changes. I, I don't think that should be particularly difficult, um, and doesn't necessarily require writing a bunch of crazy interposition code if the open tracing instrumentation already exists. It's more a matter of discovering what's in the process, knowing what's out there in the world, and then doing the binding between those two things uh, dynamically. I don't know if other people have thought very hard about that, but I think it would give some of the benefits of both worlds. Um, the explicit instrumentation has some real benefits too in terms of maintainability, I think. Um, but uh, it's a bummer to have to make code changes in order to get basic bindings set up at, at, in the in the main line. Yeah, I'm curious on that front. I see Pavel's on the call. And I know, Pavel, you've done a lot of work on auto configuration for Java Spring. Uh, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts on on generalizing that auto configuration to just open tracing Java in general and how feasible that might be. Just to avoid having to to manually uh, thread together all of the, the packages. Sorry, but I wasn't listening last five minutes. Oh, it's fine. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it depends on the on the runtime. You, you, you. Yeah, but the Java runtime in particular. Well, yeah, but auto configuration is feature of the Spring Boot framework. I'm not sure how something similar is feasible in plain Java. Mm. No, because that seems like ha half of when people talk about agent, it does seem like Ben said it's. Part of it is just being able to take the existing open tracing packages and get get them installed without having to to write a lot of code. Um, it's not. It's maybe a separate problem from then being able to dynamically insert call points or something like that. You're not dynamically inserting the call points. You're simply um, changing which packages are involved. And I don't know, it would be an interesting experiment to see what what would be feasible in Java on that front. but perhaps another time. Uh, I think Spring Boot, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I think Spring Boot of the configuration is just, it uses bytecode manipulation behind the scenes yeah. to exactly like load the classes and change the configuration. So it's kind of similar to our open tracing Java agent. So that's one approach. On an unrelated note, uh, one higher level abstraction, I think we could benefit from and maybe even consider baking into some of the API packages is we have these semantic descriptions of uh, certain common patterns around RPC calls, database calls, things of that nature. But when you wanna go use them, uh, you have to sort of glue together a bunch of individual tags or logs in order to, to make that happen. And one very simple, straightforward form of sugar would be um, something that allowed you to, you know, that was a little bit more of a guide on, on what you had to put in there. So rather than having to uh, refer to a, a spec sheet somewhere about uh, what all the fields were you needed to add in order to record an HTTP call, if there was just a, a function you could call that had all the fields, required fields as a parameter there, uh, just to make it clear and easier to people. 
um, rather than them having to do it themselves. So you would just say, you know, tag HTTP or something like that, and then it would have five fields on it. I've seen some people asking for something similar or more structured tags in general. Not sure what people think about that. Yeah, that's definitely something that we're, we're, we were doing. Uh, we have a span API for Go that does that I wrote that does that for database queries and cache requests and external and incoming service calls and HTTP requests, you know, because we are looking for specific tags and it's really helpful to be able to formalize those for our users. I think that um, is uh, uh, something we're going to end up continuing to provide in all the languages just and try to make it consistent because right now we just have docs where we're like, here's all your tags. You better remember them. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice. Great. We have a, we have a terrible API for custom SDK where you need to um, propagate context between events in a span, which is a little harder than propagating spans. And then, and then you have to actually be very careful that you use the same tags in the start and end event, for example, in certain cases. Um, so we do try to simplify those. We do duplicate certain um, repeated values that have to show up in both events. Awesome. I imagine a lot of that specific uh, to your product, but is that, that open? Is it something you can take a look at? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's basically an open tracing mapping from open tracing's HTTP tags to our internal tags in my OT implementation for Go, for example. And if there was something that came cooked up from the OT team where there's a several, you know, standard helper functions that people are using, we would just map it to internal values that we index for ourselves. Uh, yeah, it's just funny because every vendor is probably indexing each of the tags differently, right? And so like some pe person's requirements are different. Like the, the number of required tags for a database query is probably vastly different across the different vendors who would be doing this. Yeah, this came up in the trace context working group, uh, attempting to to find, you know, what is the commonality if we're going to have some common standard definition of an HTTP request. And it does sound like a noble thing, but it was also instantly clear that everyone had kind of a slightly different opinion about what was important and what was the correct way to slice it. So it might be a little bit tricky to come up with a universal standard for that. So we are going to take a shot at it. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, it's uh, it's nine ten, so we should probably uh, move on. But I do want to use this opportunity to to promote trace identifiers. We're going to make a PR hopefully next week to Java to add those. So people who have a Java tracer, keep that in mind. That'll be a thing coming down the pipe, and the hope is by exposing getters for trace ID and span ID, that'll make some of these middleware and other higher level abstractions uh, easier for people to write, easier to integrate um, the tracing call sites into uh, secondary systems that they're already using. So just heads up that that's coming up. Okay, moving on to the next agenda item. Um, I want to make everyone aware that we're going to do a docuthon uh, next, uh, so Wednesday after next, June 13th. Uh, what I mean by docuthon is we, we have some documentation on the website, but we feel that currently it's pretty insufficient. Uh, it could be a lot more detailed in terms of describing all these concepts in general, and then it would be great if we had on top of that sort of language-specific documentation uh, that described all of these contexts, uh, described all of these uh, uh, scenarios that, that you encounter in open tracing, but in the context of the specific language, because we think that would be really helpful uh, for end users to have uh, all of that detail at their fingertips when they came to the website. At the same time, uh, we found the current Jekyll implementation of the website to be in kind of difficult for people to use if you're starting from a clean Mac, uh, for example, a MacBook, it can take up to an hour and a half to install everything you need in order to make a change to the website. So on that front, um, 
uh, Luke Perkins from CNCF has been kind enough to uh, create a Hugo version of the website uh, that doesn't have that installation requirement because you can just get the Hugo binary uh, and start running with it. And at the same time, it, it works fairly similar to the current website where you're just writing markdown files. So now that that's out the door, we'd like to use it as an opportunity to uh, kind of overhaul the documentation on the website. And because that's a little bit slow going, we thought we would have a sort of hack day where we got together people who work on the various languages, uh, some copy editors and uh, people who like writing documentation, hopefully some end users as well, uh, to sort of sit down as a group and just jam out uh, as much of the docs as they can. So we're doing some prep work there to get the new site set up with enough scaffolding and kind of bullet pointed versions of the different kinds of docs we think we need to see so people aren't operating from a blank page. But what I would like to ask is uh, if people are interested in this that uh, they they sign up with the sign up form. Uh, so I'm gonna post that. Post that into the, the chat right there. And to find people that you work with um, in your company uh, who would be interested in uh, contributing to the docs. So that's people who either know how to write or people who know how open tracing works. And if we can get a good group together, we're also gonna try to get some documentation uh, experts from the Floss community to kind of guide us on this. And this is coming right up. It'll be the week after next if we don't get it all done in the first session, uh, but we like this format, we may have a second one, but uh, put the word out, please. So I'll be announcing this on Twitter and making a blog post and everything else. But I wanted to tell you all first. And uh, though she's not on the call here, I wanna do a shout out to Julie Stickler from Red Hat, who's been a total champ in uh, getting this together. All right. Any questions on Docuthon before we move on to the final agenda item? Cool, all right. Uh, so we've got a uh, final agenda. There was a question I think from Yuri about our playbook in SLA for, for tickets and PRs. Uh, I agree, there's a lot of things that have kind of gotten long in the tooth there, but Yuri, do you wanna do you want to talk about that? I'm not sure I want to talk about that. I just want to uh, <laughs> come up with some sort of a process for this. Uh, something I just am, am in the process of setting up for myself and could probably share open tracing wide is uh, just some code to identify stale issues. Uh, I decided uh, stale issues for me mean anything that is is active uh, that hasn't received a, a response from uh, someone directly associated with the project, either someone from one of the language maintainer teams or another core member um, for seven days. So anything that's gone more than seven days without a response, um, but isn't tagged in some way as being on ice uh, is stale, and then I want to uh, make sure that gets someone assigned to it and some attention. So uh, if I get something that automatically scrapes all of that, uh, I'll try to try to share it with you and others so that we can maybe track it a little bit better. But uh, beyond that, it would be great. I feel like we we have people who are interested in responding and and managing PRs and issues, but. Uh, the process for, for deciding uh, who gets assigned to what, I feel is still a little muddy. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Yuri, on like how we could clean that, that part of the process up. Uh, I think in my view, the problem is not like assigning someone, but actually uh, coming to consensus because there is certain like, uh, I think the, the longest PRs, they're controversial. And so we may, um, we may need so like we used to do this on this call right to just to go through some uh, like like important issues that being opened uh, mm -hmm. so maybe we need some some time dedicated where there's a, like a group of people where we can just at high speed discuss 
uh, and make a decision on particular PRs and then just render it. Yeah, sounds good. So we yeah. have. The, sorry, Ben, you wanted to. I was going to say, uh, yeah. You want to mute? Ah, that's probably better. One one thing that we've um, done, in, well, that I've done in other settings would be to have uh, some expectation around them. I don't know if you want to call it an SLA or an expectation or whatever, but there is an expectation that that uh, the people who are responsible for certain repositories are supposed to respond to new comments on issues or PRs within a certain amount of time. And then, uh, and then there could just be an understanding that if the discussion is getting kind of complicated, that you're supposed to resolve that, uh, you know, in a forum like this or something that happens more frequently than once a month or whatever. Because I, I definitely think that GitHub is just a horrendous place to resolve like really thorny issues that often take like 10 minutes in a meeting where you have all the participants and people can can uh, actually have a dialogue about it. So I like the idea of that, but it seems to me that we, um, uh, we don't have, um, and for certain repositories, we don't have that kind of, there, there's no one who's responsible for just responding to new issues and PRs, uh, and it gets done sometimes, but it's kind of ad hoc, like it almost seems like that would need to happen first and that you need to get to a sticking point before you would escalate or whatever you want to call it to uh, a meeting like this. Does, does that make sense? Like, I don't, I don't know if other people feel that way, but, but some repositories I don't think are being watched that carefully necessarily. That, that's probably as much of an issue to me as, as being able to discuss things in a forum like this. Yeah, there is a part of that too. But I mean, I guess what I'm saying is, if we if we defer every discussion for uh, like an in-person meeting, then it will become a scheduling problem, and you know, progress will get made. But it, but if we don't use these sorts of meetings to discuss things that are difficult over GitHub, then they'll they'll get stalled because we just can't resolve certain issues very well asynchronously over GitHub. So um, I I would just I just think it would be great if there's a general practice within that core open tracing organization to use GitHub to, to make sure that people responsible for a particular language or repository um, should respond within a certain amount of time to make sure things don't just kind of stall out uh, by async channels. And then if things are getting difficult to resolve that, that we quickly escalate to, um, if it's just two people that are having the discussion, they can have a meeting and then summarize and, you know, an update on GitHub what the, what the notes were. But, um, but it would be great to avoid some of these threads that I've seen, and I'm sure I've also seen on GitHub, open tracing or otherwise, where you have some issue and there are hundreds of messages and then no one can ever come in and actually follow the discussion. It's, it just, it's not an effective experience. Well, I have, I have two concrete suggestions I can make on that front. One is uh, we have a cross-language working group meeting every week it's usually at this time, but we could start varying the time up. Uh, and that's mostly been focused on rolling out API changes that have already been approved and making sure they go in you know, evenly across the different languages. But because that kind of work is calming down with scopes getting completed in basically all of the languages, uh, we could be using that time to resolving uh, some of these issues. I think uh, the only thing we want to make sure we do there is if we're going to discuss one of these issues on one of these calls that we promote it ahead of time. So just to make sure that the people actually care about that uh, are actually going to show up to the call because it doesn't make a lot of sense to have a call and make a decision and then have someone who cares be like, I object and they weren't there. Um, so as long as we promote it though, that is a weekly forum for having this kind of discussion. The other thing I'll say when there's a log jam in the past, especially around API changes, something that I've found is it usually means the English language has ceased to be specific enough. And a lot of these sort of long tail discussions are about issues that maybe they're important, maybe they aren't. People are talking past each other. And when we've switched from English to, to code and tests, that's done wonders for kind of clearing up a lot of this. We really saw this with scopes where it just seemed impossible to come to conclusions about 
what was uh, a serious issue or whether this API was going to work in this scenario or that scenario. And just switching to code examples and tests uh, really broke the logjam and all of that. So uh, that would be my other suggestion. When things seem to be getting too long, just ask people to, to actually start writing code to explain their point rather than continue to debate it in English. All right. I think that covers that. And we're out of agenda and we're almost done with the meeting. Does anyone have any uh, final questions or comments or things they'd like to discuss before we go away? Great. Well, uh, looking forward to seeing some of you at Monotorama next week. And for the rest of you, hopefully you show up for Docuthon. I am gonna keep, keep poking everyone on that front. So uh, give me a shout out if uh, you're interested in organizing an in-person meetup. We're gonna have one in San Francisco, another one in Boston, another one in Munich. Someone in Portland wants to organize one or elsewhere, let me know. And uh, yeah, I'll see you all on the internet. Is there a chasing meetup at Monotrama again this year? Uh, you know, I asked, on, I asked on Slack if people wanted to do that and uh, haven't gotten much response. I'm happy to host it. I think the way we'd probably want to do it this year is just go to a coffee shop or something nearby if people want, uh, want to do it. Um, but if you're interested, uh, yeah, please log into the Monotrama Slack and, and make a post there. Um, I feel like we sort of got away by just bringing a bunch of food in and taking over some space at the venue last year, but, uh, you know, I don't know if we'll get away with it. Yeah, again. I, I mean, I think the, I, the Montrava people were fine with it, but the venue, I'm positive that they'd found out that we were doing that would have been really upset. Like I learned afterwards that that was really bad <laughs> and we, they just didn't notice. Um, so I feel a little bit like, I don't know, it doesn't seem super, super duper moral or ethical or something to knowingly and last time it ignorantly did that but this time it'd be knowingly <laughs> suggesting we do that i actually can't be there for family reason but um i don't know maybe erica if one of the new relic people uh if there's some space in portland that's like close to that venue that's available that could host it but i checked last year and like the public spaces are not that close or not that good for something so i think that's why i tend to think a coffee shop might make more sense than anything else yeah. sure new relic would be happy uh if you're interested again we can explore it uh, i didn't i'm not sure what the concerns were last year but happy to talk about it more cool yeah as far as I can tell, that stuff mostly gets organized through Slack on Monotorama, but I'm totally happy to have one again. It'd be lovely to see you all and, and talk shop on tracing. So even if it's just a couple of us, yeah, let's grab breakfast on, uh, let's, let's just call it Tuesday, Tuesday or Wednesday, but let's aim for Tuesday and uh, uh, see if that works. Great. And we are out of time. Yeah. Bye. Here you go. Thanks. Here you go.